I am honored to have CP, the franchise, join us on thecallsports.com at 917-973-1717, New York's only commercial-free sports talk radio. CP, how you doing this morning, brother? Bill, good morning. It's it's a pleasure to be on with you, man. And, you know, I just got to let you know that as I've been on this uh, sports media journey, you know, and, and thinking about a lot of my inspirations, uh, it goes back to, you know, the WFAN days, obviously ESPN radio, and, and you were a big part of that, man. So, to, you know, to be on with you this morning is, is really an honor. CP, I'm just glad I can help the team, brother. And you, you've done some marvelous work in your own regard. We mentioned that you were also on Sirius NBA Radio, but your main vehicle is Nick Fan TV, which you podcast, which you also have on YouTube following Nick Games during the regular season. It's it's a great post game show. I did pretty good with that post game stuff, bro. So I I mean you you're moving in the right direction. You're trending in the right direction. The needle is going where it needs to go. I appreciate that so much. And, you know, I've been so proud of, uh, you know, this journey that I've been on over the last five years, really trying to create a platform for the fans to uh, have more of a voice on the team. You know, the last 20 plus years hasn't been great for this Nick team, but nevertheless, the fans are still diehard. They're still passionate and there's a worldwide presence. And so, you know, the establishment of Knicks Fan TV was really just to, to tap into that global fan base and just give them more insight onto the team, more of an input on for the with the team uh, meeting that 24-7 news cycle, that on-demand content that uh, is is really present, you know, in, in the media space. I mean, CP, when you, when you think about it, I mean, when David Stern was talking about being international, the focus was more on Asia because you had Yao Ming, you had Stefan Marbury, both leaving the NBA imprint over there. Then you had Dikembe Mutombo taking it to Africa. But now it has spread far and wide. It is, it is like a wildfire, a, a beautiful wildfire that is engulfing the rest of the planet. Oh, no question, Bill. And, and as we, we talked about before this show, you know, we, we have a, a big presence in Australia and New Zealand. We have a guy who calls in from India you know, uh, Vietnam. I mean, it's truly, truly global. Basketball is a global game. And so to be able to connect with fans all over the world, it's really, you know, a testament to the community that we've built over the last five years. Talking with CP, the franchise, Bill Daughtry on the call, sports.com, 917-793-1717 on Twitter at Silver16C7. So I want to talk about the the current Knicks, the coming season. Preseason starts next Tuesday, as we just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, against the Pistons, the game on TNT. But you got to take me behind the scenes, man, the R.J. Barrett interview. How did that come about? Was that uh, 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 something through the team, or was that something through Puma, who he is endorsing now? And, And more importantly, is this Puma connection because of our man Walt Clyde Frazier? (laughs) <laughs> you, you know what shout out to Clyde man one of the pioneers uh in the sneaker game and, and certainly you know one of my favorite Knicks and one of my favorite people of all time uh but the Puma engagement came about uh through Puma you know Puma was releasing RJ Barrett's new sneaker which is called the Fusion Nitro aka the Made Difference and they reached out to me because they wanted to host this meet and greet event at the Puma flagship store here in, in New York City and Fifth Avenue. And they, they wanted me to host it. You know, the, the marketing director of Puma, I met with her and she said, you know, we've been wanting to work with you for such a long time uh, because of your presence in this space and, and just being so tapped in with the fan base around the city. And so, you know, I, I lit up because it was a tremendous opportunity uh, to, to really present the fans with something different and to con- to show the fans, you know, the continued evolution of Knicks Fan TV, not just being a, you know, a, a platform to to host post game shows, but really just an overall sports media company. You know, that's how I really want this this uh, this engagement to be viewed. And so, you know, we, we hosted the event, we we pr- co produced the event with with Puma, we live streamed it to the platform, and uh, it was just an incredible experience. CP, the franchise, franchise moving on up, as the Jeffersons used to say. <laughs> so what, what was the most important thing that you learned about R.J. Barrett in your sit-down? It was really just his competitive spirit, Bill. As he would admit, you know, he, he said, I'm not the most skilled player, but I'm going to put in the work. 
I want to outwork everybody. I want to beat everybody at everything. And I'm going to put in the time to be better. And you, you've kind of seen that it, through his three years so far. He went from 14 points per game to 17 points per game to 20 points per game. And in his most recent season, just really taking on more of a leadership role and wanting to be that guy for the New York Knicks. Wanting to be the guy that they dump the ball down to in the clutch and go out there and, and get a bucket. And so it, it's not just R.J. Barrett, but the people that I spoke to on his team that would tell me, look, you don't understand. This kid, he, he's not normal. He's 22 years old. He wants to be in the gym any chance that he can get. He's not going out to the club. He doesn't want to go out to hang out. He wants to put in the work to be great. And that, to me, is very important when it comes to, to being in New York, Bill. You have to be focused. You have to have a solid head on your shoulders and have that maturity because, as you know, Bill, you've been in this game for, for decades. This place will chew you up fast. And as my guy Chuck D would say, it's called Microwave Square Garden for a reason. It's the heaviest jersey to wear in the league. And so you really have to be focused and disciplined uh, uh, to, to be in this town. And I think R.J. Barrett is, is headed in the right direction. CP, what is it about RJ that New York just doesn't seem to get? Because after they played the Lakers in Los Angeles, I think you'll remember this, uh, LeBron James took time to single RJ out after the game, both on the court and in his post-game comments, talking about how impressed he was with the young man and how he thought that he was going to be what the future of the Knicks was all about. And then what you saw throughout the season on the court, R.J. Barrett, a left-hander, really developing and really working on and scoring frequently with his right hand in traffic, using that right-hand handle to get to the basket, but still... There is this this reluctance, this reticence of 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 New York and, and Nick fans to embrace him as their star, which he really is now just by basis of the contract that he signed during the offseason. No question. I, I think what his ceiling is is certainly a question mark, not just for Knicks fans, but also for the team. You know, when R.J. Barrett was eligible for a five-year, $193 million rookie max extension, there was questions about just how much he was going to get. Was he going to be worth that just as his peers received that in Zion Williamson, Darius Garland received that, the full max. But it, there was question marks in terms of RJ ceiling. And I think the, the questions lie in his efficiency. You know, RJ gets his buckets, but it's not flashy, Bill. It's not efficient. It, it's very much lunch pail, uh, you know, kind of attempts. And it, the shooting numbers, the shooting efficiency has to improve. You know, he's not an overly great three-point shooter, doesn't shoot it well off the dribble. As he would admit, you know, in our interview, he he admitted to me, that is something that I'm working on. He only has an effective field goal percentage of about 33% in pull-up shooting. And so that needs to improve. Uh, can he improve on his catch-and-shoot numbers? They were very good in his second year, but last year they kind of tailed mm -hmm. off a bit. And if he's going to be playing off of a guy like a Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle, that's going to have to improve. And so I think that's where a lot of the question marks lie with the fans is, you know, it's it's his shooting numbers are inefficient. He needs to improve on his free throw shooting. Shot it at about 74% last year. Even though he gets to the basket very well, Bill, you know, 41% of his shooting comes at the rim, which is about the 80-something percentile in the league amongst his peers. He only finishes at about a 50% uh, uh, clip. And so those numbers, Bill, it, it kind of leaves you areas for caution just in terms of just how good he can be. And so, as I said, to open the show, you know, RJ is working on those areas, his finishing, his shooting off the dribble and his playmaking as well. If he can do those things, he's going to continue to get better. With CP, the franchise, Bill Daughtry on thecallsports.com, let's talk about the rest of this Nick team. This was the first deep dive I've done into their roster. We can start with the starters. We already discussed R.J. Barrett. Jalen Brunson comes over in free agency from Dallas. Evan Fournier is back again after winning a, a EuroLeague championship with France. Uh, Julius Randle joins them on the front line along with the newly re-signed Mitchell Robinson. 
your evaluation of this starting five? There's a lot of potential in this starting lineup offensively. I think if you first start off with Jalen Brunson, I mean, Bill, the Knicks have not had a stabilizing force at the point guard position in about 10 years, maybe since Raymond Felton was here. You know, it's been mm-hmm. that long since the Knicks have had stability at that position. Last year, they ran a, a patchwork uh, point guard rotation. Kemba Walker experiment flopped very early. They moved in Alec Burks, a guy who is a, is a utility player player but mainly a scorer he's, he's not to be viewed as a point guard to get your offense into a flow and so the Knicks offense once again finished uh in the bottom third of the league Jalen Brunson I think is going to bring something different number one he's 25 years old which is a breath of fresh air but he's going to bring scoring inside the perimeter he is as I as I told you RJ Barrett's not a good good finisher Jalen Brunson is a great finisher he's one of the best players in the league in pick and roll offense something that Tom Thibodeau is really going to re- rely upon on him uh, one of those areas is going to be look out for that pick and roll dynamic be- between he and, and Mitchell Robinson I hope that he and Julius Randle can can uh, create some sort of chemistry there in the pick and roll and help Julius Randle become a better player but no question about it Brunson's efficiency inside the arc is going to help the Knicks when he gets downhill. He's going to be able to kick it out. Now, that's where you have Evan Fournier, your best three-point shooter on the team. He broke the three-point record for most threes in in, the, in a single season for the Knicks. That's where he'll be able to get his points. You hope that R.J. Barrett can feed off of Jalen Brunson in that regard. And so I think this offense certainly has potential. Randall is going to be a big key in terms of how far the offense goes because now when you have a Brunson here who's going to demand the ball, who's going to be another high usage player, you have RJ Barrett who whose usage increased last year as well, Randall's going to be a big question mark in terms of can he play off of those guys? He's a guy who's used to having the ball in his hands, but they're going to need him to be able to play off of them as well. Now, defensively, is where this thing could be tricky because Brunson overall is is, is not a great in, uh, individual defender. Neither is Fournier. And if you're going to put those two guys in the backcourt in a league where, you know, perimeter play, perimeter defense is crucial, that's where Tom Thibodeau is going to have to earn his check as a defensive-minded coach. He is going to have to devise a team defense scheme that does not expose these guys in the backcourt. Uh, because if they do, I think that is where a trouble could lie. And, and Tom Thibodeau is going to have to look at that bench for some help. Which it leads us to Mitchell Robinson, the defensive anchor, a role that Nerlens Noel played so marvelously well two seasons ago. Last year, he was not available because of various injuries throughout most of the season. But Mitchell Robinson, a guy who he got the bag in the offseason, I would get the uh, impression that the dependence on him, the weight on him is going to increase just a little bit more as it normally does when you get more money. But you can start with Mitchell Robinson on defense, and now you've got to find at least two other guys to come along on that ride. Who's most likely to be that guy? Well, one has to be R.J. Barrett, and in our interview, I I spoke to him about the challenge of being a two-way player when, you you know, he plays a very physical style of offense. It's very downhill. It's attack. He's using his body a lot. And then on the flip side, he has to guard the likes of a Jason Tatum one night. It could be a Jimmy Butler. Maybe he gets switched on to Kevin Durant on, on some switches. Maybe it's James Harden some night. So R.J. Barrett's task is very, very difficult, but... Because he has to guard the premier talent. It's a wing league, Bill. So R.J. Barrett's job is going to be magnified. And so, as you said, Mitchell Robinson is there. He's going to clean up a lot of mistakes for them. He's going to give them that rim protection. Another year under his belt. You hope that he comes into camp in better shape. Last year was a bit of a struggle coming off of injury and and weight issues. But you hope Mitchell Robinson comes into camp in better shape. He's going to clean up a lot for them. And then offensively, uh, you know, his skill set lies in in cleaning up a lot of their misses. You know, top is yeah. tops in the league in terms of offensive rebounding percentage. You know, he's going to get those putbacks for them. Hopefully, as I said, the pick and roll game with he and Brunson will be potent. He and R.J. Barrett as well had some connections there. But Mitchell Robinson, Bill, also has to clean up at the free throw line. You know, 48% at the stripe is abysmal so he's got to clean that up you don't want to hack a mitch or hack a shack situation where you know you have to take him out of the rotation here to bring in somebody else with more efficiency so he's got to clean that up as well to 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 have you know a true impact on this team 
Mitchell Robinson, uh, a lot of the video you saw of him during the off season, he had a basketball in his hands, not working on defensive stuff at all, but instead working on, as you said, free throws, working on some moves in the low post and, heaven forbid, even throwing up a few from beyond the arc. So <laughs> Mitchell is, you know, he's, he's about it. He, he, he can be a quirky guy, but this is a season where – there is going to be a heavy dependence on him. And now that he has the paycheck to go with it, you only hope he can respond to the challenge. And so far, it's looking pretty good. Talking with CP, the franchise from Nick Fan TV and Sirius NBA Radio, as we look at this bench now, and again, the focus on defense, I think, I think Grimes is a given defensively. He's shown us some great flashes in this past season. He's got the size. You saw some more of it in Summer League, which I get is a different animal, is a different cat altogether. But he has shown some tendencies, and he's shown enough that you kind of expect him to be one of those defensive stoppers either at the two or at the three for this basketball team. And the good news is he's out of that walking boot, and he's starting to – take part in regular workouts now. So that's a plus. But then there's a, a couple of X factors. Yeah. And, and the X factors are going to be Obi Toppin. And are you ready? Cam Reddish. Yeah. Yeah, a- absolutely. And, you know, as you said in Grimes, you know, he's, he's going to be- play a big factor for this team. We talked about Fournier being in this starting lineup for now, but I ultimately think that Grimes will close uh, for this team, being closing lineups in Fournier's absence. You know, Evan Fournier did not close a lot of games last year because of his defensive inabilities. And so I think Grimes is going to take that spot and ultimately assume uh, a starting spot in that rotation, whether it's, you know, through the second half of this year or going into next year. But as you said, you look at that bench, you have a Cam Reddish sitting there, and we're talking about defense and defensive versatility, which I think is very, very important in this league as teams are able to play positionless basketball. You need guys who can go out there and guard multiple positions. Cam Reddish, he has the wingspan. He has the athleticism. He has the ability to guard multiple positions, whether it's the two, the three, maybe even a small ball four, depending on who he's guarding. The question is playing time, Bill, because we spoke about Fournier. We spoke about Grimes. I think Cam Reddish, unfortunately, is on the outside looking in of this rotation. And it's going to be up to the Knicks and Tom Thibodeau to figure out how to get him involved. They traded a first-round pick, a protected first-round pick, to the Atlanta Hawks to acquire uh, Cam Reddish. He's also going to be a free agent in a few years. They have to make a decision on whether or not they're going to sign him to a rookie extension and what that deal is worth. But right now, he's being blocked by a Grimes, by a Fournier. But nevertheless, he has the potential to help this team on both ends. You know, offensively, this team is lacking athleticism. Cam Reddish is a guy who's he's got a quick first step. He has the ability to get his own shot. He just has not shown that consistently throughout his entire basketball journey, whether it's in the high school level, at College at Duke, or so far professionally. He's very up and down, very inconsistent. And so Cam Reddish has to show the hunger and the drive, whether it's in training camp practice or in these games, to show the Knicks, hey, I belong here, you need me, and and I have some staying power in this league, and so that that's certainly a tricky situation. Obi Toppin, another player who whose minutes could be blocked by Julius Randle. Remember, the Knicks signed Julius Randle to a max extension two years ago. That extension kicks in this year. And so last year, Obi Toppin was relegated to maybe about 15, 20 minutes a night when Julius Randle starts. When Julius Randle came out of the rotation due to injury last year, Obi Toppin emerged, and and there was a, a considerable impact on this team when Obi Toppin was in the lineup. Number one, he gets you easy buckets. He's always leaking out in transition. He plays fast. He Obviously, the athleticism is off the charts, the highlight reels, the dunks, you name it, but the efficiency on offense when Obi Toppin is in this lineup cannot be denied and so Tom Thibodeau once again has to figure out how to get this kid into the rotation and get him considerable minutes because right now what he's telling us in in training camp what he said so far in the three years that Obi's been here is that there is a reluctancy to play Toppin and Randall together for considerable minutes 
Therefore, the only way this kid is going to get more minutes is Randall's minutes coming down or, you know, the unforeseen maybe injury or something like that, which you're not hoping for. But nevertheless, he has to play a role for this team to be successful this year. Well, you know, this is this is one of the things that gets me, CP, is that this reluctance to play Randall and Obi together. I have fancied Obi Toppin as a three. I really have. I've I, I've thought about it. I've looked at it. I mean, he's got elements of Hawkins. He's got elements of Julius. Not saying that he would be rising to the level of each of those players, but he's got that kind of mentality, particularly on offense. He has enough of a handle. He's shown you toward the end of last season that he can knock down a three. He's not a, oh, my gosh, he's got the ball in the corner. No, those days are gone now. You you, you expect something out of him when you see him in the corner with the, shooting the three ball. But the question is, is why is there this reluctance? If, if CP, the franchise, were the head coach of the Knicks, would you have any problem in using Obi Toppin at the three? I drafted him eighth. If I drafted him eighth, Bill, he has to play. And so that means I need a coach who is willing to take risks and is willing to be innovative. Look at what J.B. Bickerstaff did with that Cleveland Cavaliers team. He played Lowry Marketing at the three. He had Evan Mobley at the four and Jared Allen at the five. He played a huge front court, and that team was a formidable team. They improved considerably last year. It's something that the Knicks need to try. I think a guy like a Ty Lue would would try something like that. But Thibodeau seems to be very stuck in his ways. He's very traditional. He wants to keep a traditional center into the lineup to have rim protection. And I think he doesn't trust, it might not be Toppin, but he doesn't trust Randall as a rim protector at the five. And also Toppin, you know, Toppin's defense isn't isn't off the charts. He does need to rebound a little bit better. But nevertheless, as I said, good things happen when this kid is in the rotation. They have to figure it out or else when it's time to to decide whether or not you're going to bring him back off of his rookie deal, the Knicks are going to have some tough decisions to make. And it's because they have not gotten enough of a look at him in this rotation. And so, again, it's going to have to happen for this team to have some success. Yeah, As I look at the depth chart, CP, I, I, I don't see any Randall at the five, and I don't see any Obi at the three. And those two things are troubling to me because both of those players, I think, could give you solid minutes at those positions. But, again, as you go back and, and talk about Thibodeau and his ways, and, and I totally get it. He's got to trust guys on defense, but if he can find pieces elsewhere, uh, uh, guys in other roles, he can still use those guys effectively on offense at those positions. When uh, On our show, we, we do a lineup show where we kind of play fantasy basketball a little bit and talk about lineups that we'd like to see. And my closing lineup had uh, Jalen Brunson, Quinton Grimes, who I, who I mentioned earlier, I figure is going to be a closer, R.J. Barrett, Obi Toppin, Julius Randle. That, those are the five I want to see out there in crunch time and, and just see where we can go. As Obi Toppin even admitted last year, Bill, when he got extended minutes, his confidence grew. That's big for a young player. You know, because so for, for his first two seasons, most of it was short minutes. If he made a mistake, he was coming out of the game. If he missed a shot or missed an assignment, he's looking at the bench because he's looking at the scorer's table to look to come back to the bench because he expected the coach to reprimand him for his mistakes. But as he said, when he didn't have to look be over his shoulder, he was so loose. He was so free. And it and it showed out there on the court. He had a 40-point game in, in some of the Knicks' closing games of last season. I mean, the kid is just waiting, waiting to shine for this team. And it would be a travesty if, if they can't tap into that potential. Let's touch on uh, the players we haven't mentioned in our closing minutes. We haven't mentioned Derrick Rose. We haven't mentioned Emmanuel Quickly. We haven't mentioned Jericho Sims, nor have we mentioned the new acquisition, Mr. Hartenstein. Well, one guy I'm looking very, very much forward to looking at uh, coming into the season is Derrick Rose. There's no question. Uh, when they acquired Derrick Rose two years ago, he was the spark plug. You know, Julius kind of set the table. 
and Drew and Derrick Rose took them home in terms of getting to the playoffs, making that fourth seed, and just being that reliable veteran, former MVP, who you could dump it down to and say, hey, go get me a bucket in this pressure cooker situation and take us home. And Derrick Rose was so good for this team two years ago. Last year, injuries. You know, that's his Achilles heel, you know, pun intended. The injuries is always something that you have to factor in with Derrick Rose. Now he's coming into camp, uh, the lightest he's been since his rookie year. And hasn't put his shirt on yet. He has not has not put his I don't think he's put his shirt on yet, Bill. Correct. <laughs> and so but there's no question the impact that he's gonna have on the second unit playing alongside Emmanuel Quickly, who's coming into his third year. Uh the chemistry that Rose and Obi Toppin had was immediate when he came to this team. You add in a Hartenstein as well and, and probably a Grimes, and I think that second unit is, is once again going to be a strength for this team. And again, when Rose is on that second unit, playing against backups of other teams, he can still provide you with that spark. He can still go out there and get you some buckets. And in the NBA, shot creation is essential to your success. Talk about Emmanuel quickly going into his third season. You know, last year, I thought quickly really took a step as a playmaker for this team. It seemed like the game was slowing down for him a little bit. He made a lot better decisions. Finished with two triple doubles on the season. The chemistry with Obi Toppin was off the charts. And then he's going to give you some shot making as well, especially from three. You want to see his efficiency from inside the arc improve a little bit. But I think quickly is really starting to mature. The game is slowing down for him. And I think he and Rose in that backcourt is going to be problems for second units. Sims, you know, with the acquisition of Hartenstein, I'm not sure where Sims' minutes are going to come from. But he certainly earned it. Last year, when, when Mitchell Robinson was down due to injury, which is of no surprise, you know, Sims really came on strong. There was one game in particular when the Knicks were playing the Nets, and Robinson was playing. But in a crunch time situation, Thibodeau had Sims out there, and he was doing a great job guarding players on the perimeter, recovering back to the rim to provide rim protection. They would have him come out and, and blitz pick and rolls with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving then run back to the rim to, to to recover he was great in that role obviously we know that he can fly out of the gym when they're throwing the pick and rolls and so Sims definitely deserves minutes but with the new acquisition of Isaiah Hartenstein I'm not sure sure he's going to get that unless you have an injury to to Robinson or Hartenstein or maybe some uh, ineffective play what Hartenstein is going to bring to this team is a different look than what Robinson and Sims are going to bring. Robinson and Sims are, are mainly rim runners, right? They're going to dive to the rim and get you some uh, high efficiency shots at the, on in the dunker spot, so on and so forth. But what Hartenstein can do is he can space the floor a little bit. And he's a savvy passer, Bill, something that the Knicks really haven't had. And it's something that Tom Thibodeau liked to emphasize when he had Joe Kim Noah at Chicago. And so I think what I would look out for is the chemistry between Hartenstein and Obi Toppin, where you'll see Hartenstein running some plays from, uh, you know, the, the high post. And you'll see Obi Toppin cutting, you know, cutting to the basket, spinning off his defender, catching alley-oops from a Hartenstein. And so Hartenstein's really going to bring that, that a different element than what uh, uh, Sims and Robinson are going to bring. Plus some tenacity and hustle rebounding. I think he's going to be a fan favorite uh, for the Knicks fans as well. So I, I like that Hartenstein pickup a lot. CP, the franchise, you are a fan favorite. Uh, we look forward to your work on Sirius NBA Radio and, of course, on your staple Nick Fan TV. This conversation will be continued. I mean, for the first time in about 15 years, the Knicks really have some options, some, some people they can say yay or nay to on their bench and still have something left over. It's going to be an interesting season. I just want to see who are going to be those three guys that emerge as defenders that Thibodeau can trust, and that is what this season is going to be all about. We'll be keeping an ear and an eye on you, not only on the Internet, on your podcast, but also on YouTube TV. CP, we thank you, and keep up the great work, brother. We'll talk again real soon. Bill, always a pleasure. Anytime you need me, I'm here. And, and as I said, man, this, this was an honor to, to speak with you this morning. So uh, thanks again, and, and looking forward to a good season. CP, thanks, man. I see a post game in my future. <laughs> <laughs>